guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? (laughs) I'm great. We're in a new year. I mean, when we're recording this, technically it's not a new year, but we're we're almost we'll there. Be, it'll be there. Yes. Yeah. Well, Christmas is name. over, so I feel like you oh can gosh. we can claim the new year now. Because once you get through Christmas, this last week of December is like that one week of the year where it's just like time isn't real. Like nothing is real anymore. No. It just doesn't feel like anything is normal. Uh, we're in that like weird twilight week of the year right now. <laughs> it's pointless, except our kids are home and then that's a whole thing. And my kids, I found out, don't go back to school till January 4th. I thought it might be the third. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> we're all having fun. It's so much fun. But hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. I know it can be hard for people. People, and so I hope it was the best it could be. If not, it's over and let's there move you on go. to the rest of the year, right? There you go. That's right. That's right. So we are so excited to be back. As we said, it is a new year and we have some really cool things on the horizon uh, for us and we can't wait to share about all of that with all of you. Um, I think the main main number one thing is that, as you heard at the beginning of the episode, I officially introduced us as Moms and Mysteries. So yeah, very exciting, Let's Melissa. Back now. I know we are officially now operating under Moms and Mysteries. We are. It's it's New Year, same new us. us. Yes. Yeah. Well, not new us. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um. Oh, also by this time, our new website will be up. Momsandmysteries dot com. Our friend Rachel Hamburger, who has the coolest name in the world. Well, I think that was her maiden name, but I still call her Rachel Hamburger. She created the site for us, and it's so great. Like. We're obsessed with it. So please check that Love out. It. There's lots of stuff on there. Yeah, we look very professional. Yeah. Well, we had a website before. So some of you may have actually seen the old website or you know visited the old website. But this new website, as Melissa said, we were working really closely with Rachel for a long time to make sure that we um, got that everything was correct. And it, uh, nothing of Rachel's wrongdoing. Of course, she's wonderful. It's really Melissa and I that just don't know yeah. what we want, really. So I think we've got to a place with it where we're like really excited. So yeah, please yeah. go check out the new website. And let us know what you think. I always hate saying that. Oof, oof, <laughs> loaded question. What if somebody's New Year's resolution is to tell the truth no matter what? Don't don't contact yeah. us then. <laughs> if that's Actually, you, you, can. you don't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> because the site is awesome. So yeah, do it. You'll love it. It's awesome. Our old one, my husband made, which very nice of him, but he did not update anything. And so it has looked the same for five years. And yeah. <laughs> he's always like, I can update it. I'm like, but you don't have the time. He's like, you could pay me. I'm like, I'm not paying you. I'll yeah. pay somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so we'll get into the story for this week. And um, we have a really interesting case this week. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about it towards the end. But it, there is kind of it goes into the story that we have next week. It's not really a two-parter, but there's a little bit of a connection there. So I'm really excited. And this was a really high-profile case back in uh, the early, early 2000s. So some of you may have heard of this one before. I personally had not ever heard of this, but- Oh, really? Yeah. But then I wasn't really surprised. Well, I hate to always point this oh, out. Oh, no. Too, oh, it was in no. 2000. I really wasn't that old in the year 2000. So I need to stop this. <laughs> so it doesn't really surprise me that I have never actually heard of this. We're not bringing your ageism into 2023. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. We'll leave that one at the door. Um, so we are going to kick off the year with this episode about Robert Kissel, who was a very wealthy investment banker and was living abroad in Hong Kong at the time of his brutal killing. Robert was a family man. He was a father of three who had stepped into the life of his dreams when he accepted a position with Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong in 1998. He and his family were then put up in a $20,000 a month luxury apartment at a place called Parkview Towers, and this was fully paid for by the company. They had two domestic helpers, which are like nannies or hired help, and Robert worked really long hours for the high salary that he earned. He was at work 16 hours a day on a regular basis. And his wife, Nancy, stayed home and took care of their kids. And she participated in some charity work, which I don't know what the typical life of an investment banker is. But from some of the things I read, it sounds like um, doing charity work and just kind of helping out where you can is something that a lot of investment bankers' wives do. 
Right. So the luxury apartment complex, Parkview Towers, that they lived in was essentially kind of like a little America. They had a lot of restaurants. There were these green areas. They had pools and waterfalls and a lot of different amenities, including tennis, a driving range, all of these wonderful things right there on site, which made it so that the American expats who lived there didn't really have to venture out into the city of Hong Kong if they didn't want to. They had everything they needed right there in this complex. So after two years with Goldman Sachs, Rob joined Merrill Lynch in Hong Kong. So Rob actually got a really good start. His parents, Bill and Elaine Kissel, were also very wealthy, and they laid these high expectations on their son, Rob, and his siblings from the very beginning. Rob was the middle child. He had an older brother named Andrew and a younger sister. They were raised in New Jersey in a home with very strict rules that were expected to always be followed. He and his siblings grew up with a luxurious lifestyle that included a 7,500-square-foot home on a few acres of land, a swimming pool, and Bill and Elaine both drove luxury cars and owned a boat for the family. Rob was always very smart and quick with numbers. From as early as age five, he was calculating complex math problems in his head, and as he got older, his skills were refined, and he became a statistical and financial whiz. Not only was he gifted intellectually, but Rob was also friendly, funny, and attractive. Some might say that he really had it all. Rob got a degree from the University of Rochester's College of Engineering and then went on to attend business school at NYU. Rob was really a high achiever who got A's seemingly effortlessly. He enjoyed golfing and tennis and squash, which I don't think a lot of people play here in the States. I will show my ignorance. I didn't even know that this was a sport. At first I was reading, I was like, oh, he must really just like squash for that to be like included. (laughs) (laughs) He's a ground vegetable kind of guy. (laughs) No, root vegetable. That's what it is. Uh, Right? Now we can both look dumb. You (laughs) have no idea. (laughs) We'll go with it. I'll join you. Um, So in 1987, Rob found love in a really unlikely place. He and his college friend went to a club med vacation in the Caribbean where he met this woman named Nancy Ann Keishan, who was a restaurant manager who worked in New York City. The couple hit it off and they continued to date each other once they were back in the States. Nancy and Rob had a lot in common and their personalities really meshed well together. She was outgoing and artistic, fun-loving and friendly, just like Rob. And Nancy was really crazy about him in those early days. The couple married in 1989 and settled in New York City, where they started raising their three kids. Rob's career began on Wall Street, where he got off to really an incredible start. By the mid-90s, he was well on his way to making millions. But Rob was really humble, and he preferred not to flaunt his fortune. Instead, he was focused on climbing the ladder and achieving even greater heights in his investment-making career. In fact, Rob preferred to be a lot more conservative with his money. Nancy, on the other hand, loved to lavish herself with clothes, shoes, furs, and other nice things. And the more money they made, the more she wanted to spend. Nancy hadn't grown up with that same financial security that Rob had. So to her, money was really a way to assert yourself and to make an impression. And the couple did live a very nice life with nice cars, a nice home, and even a vacation home in Vermont. When Rob took the job with Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong... Nancy was not thrilled about the idea of moving there, but she made the most of it. Although Rob was working these really long hours, Nancy would tell friends that she and Rob had this amazing and passionate relationship and that their intimate life was really something to brag about. But that may not have been entirely true. Over the Christmas holiday in 2002, the Kissel family went on a ski trip to Canada And when they got back, Rob and Nancy started having a lot of problems in the marriage, and their relationship deteriorated pretty quickly. Within a few weeks of being back in Hong Kong, Rob had installed spyware on Nancy's home computer so that he would be able to read her emails and see other data, including her internet searches. Meanwhile, Rob was telling his friends and family about these issues that he and Nancy were having. He told his friend David about installing the spyware, and he even emailed with his sister about the idea of seeing a marriage counselor. So although there were clear issues, it seemed as though Rob was still interested in fixing them. But in early 2003, the couple became physically separated from each other when Nancy and the kids moved back to the United States 
due to the spread of SARS in Hong Kong at that time. They went to Vermont and stayed in the family's vacation home while Rob stayed behind to continue bringing in money for the family. In some cases, absence might make the heart grow fonder. But in this case, the distance provided Nancy with the opportunity to begin having an affair almost instantly after moving there. At some point after arriving in Vermont, Nancy contacted a TV repairman about coming to install some high-end television and audio equipment. She decided that she really liked this guy. It was a man named Michael, and she began having a relationship with him. They became deeply involved, and Nancy really started to spend a lot of money on this guy. And they were exchanging numerous emails back and forth that really were showing this close, intimate relationship they were having. Those emails, of course, were all able to be read by Rob thanks to that spyware he had installed. In May, Rob traveled to Vermont to visit Nancy and the kids, and while he was there, he said that he felt like Nancy was really treating him poorly, and he really, really started to suspect that she was having like a very serious affair. Shortly after returning to Hong Kong, Rob hired a PI to look into this for him, and on June 12th, the PI ran surveillance on Nancy and confirmed Rob's suspicions. A little more than a week later, on June 21st, Rob sent Nancy an email that addressed his feelings about his visit in May. He talked about how it was difficult because he had to juggle work when he was wanting to spend time with Nancy and the kids, and that it seemed as though Nancy was more than just temporarily angry at him. He said, quote, You were not available to me. You shut yourself off to me completely. I feel like sometimes I have been almost forced into being an outsider in the family, end quote. The email also said, quote, you may not be doing this consciously, and I don't know if you realize any of this, but it is extremely painful to me. I know you're going through a lot, but please try, as I am trying with you, to not inflict this emotional pain on me. Distance makes our issues harder. I think that you should come home earlier than planned, and we should get to work on ourselves. Please don't stress about this week. I will try my best to make it as stress-free for you as possible. I love you. Rob. End quote. The same day he sent this email, which was on June 21st, he flew back to Vermont where he stayed until June 29th. Rob hired that same PI to run surveillance on Nancy again, which resulted in further confirmation that Nancy was still seeing Michael, the TV repairman. On July 29th, Rob finally spoke with an attorney about the possibility of getting a divorce and said that he believed his wife was having an affair with a man that lived in Vermont. Rob's main concern, though, was that he would be able to maintain contact with his kids, especially on the weekends. The attorney prepared a draft of a separation agreement for him. Rob then confronted Nancy and told her he knew about her affair. And he was still interested in fixing things in the marriage, so he asked her to come back to Hong Kong with him, which she did on July 31st. The next day, though, which was August 1st, she emailed Michael and said, quote, it's so very difficult to reach you by phone, but please know that I'm always thinking of you and I'm driving myself crazy not speaking with you. My beloved, I love you, end quote. My what? beloved is like my least favorite. I know. I don't know what it is about the word like beloved. It feels very like <laughs> biblical and like bosom, like <laughs> Abraham and a bosom and my beloved. That's what I get. And I'm like, this is, <laughs> we're combining too many things here. So around the same time, which was early August, Rob and Nancy traveled to New York together so that Rob could have back surgery. Once again, Rob asked the same PI to look after Nancy and report back. And from that, he learned that Michael was still in the picture, which, although upsetting, still did not deter Rob's desire to work on the marriage. Nancy went back to Hong Kong on August 15th, and a week later, she bought herself a secret second phone to communicate with Michael. Rob arrived back in Hong Kong on August 23rd after recovering from his surgery, still with every intention of working on his marriage. And Nancy did seem to have a change of attitude in her as well, leading Rob to believe that reconciliation might be possible after all. But these hopes would soon be dashed. As the weeks went on, things still weren't really improving. So the couple did see a marriage counselor in September on two separate occasions. But these consultations didn't go that well. After each one of the sessions, Nancy and Rob found themselves in violent arguments that pretty much solidified the fact that their marriage was not salvageable. And things got even worse when Rob soon received a telephone bill which showed that Nancy had a second cell phone and had been using it to talk to Michael the whole time. When Rob found out about this, he was devastated at the realization that the marriage wasn't going to work out. 
and he showed his friend David the phone bill and started talking to him about plans to, you know, move forward with a conversation about getting a divorce with Nancy. He had told his friend David that he intended to bring up this possibility of getting a divorce on November the 2nd. And he also told his lawyer that he was having the big conversation on that day as well. David later described Rob's attitude towards getting a divorce as being resigned to the fact that it was going to happen, but he was willing to do anything it took to be able to have access to the children. He told David that he would give up any amount of money for them, and he planned to even get a small apartment that was really close to Parkview so that he would be in a close proximity. Rob wasn't even going to fight Nancy for full custody. He just wanted to be close enough to be able to see the kids on the weekends and to help out with them as needed. He was making every effort to make his divorce and the custody arrangement work out and to do so without a lot of stress and upset to the family. On November 2nd, the day that he planned to confront Nancy, things were seemingly pretty normal. At about 2.45 p.m. that day, one of the neighbors at Parkview, who was a guy named Andrew, brought his daughter Leah over to play with the Kissel's daughter at their apartment. Rob talked to Andrew while the kids played in the living room for about 45 minutes. And just as Andrew was about to get his daughter ready to leave, Nancy made two milkshakes, one for Andrew and one for Rob. The milkshake was very sweet. Andrew said that it had a banana flavor and it had like a slight reddish color, but there was something a little strange and just kind of off about the flavor that Andrew couldn't put his finger on. So he asked Nancy, you know, what's in the milkshake? And she responded that it was a secret recipe. Andrew and his daughter then left the Kissel apartment and headed home. But this was the last time that anyone outside of the Kissel household saw Robert alive. And we are going to get into so many more details of this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. Mandy, I don't know about you, but as my kids were opening up their Christmas gifts, I realized I may have spent a little more than I planned on doing. And if you're like me and one of your goals for the new year is to budget better and actually save money, you have to check out Rocket Money. I totally felt the same way, Melissa, and I'm so glad to have Rocket Money so I can get myself financially organized in 2023. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. I am a huge sucker for a one-week trial for a new app or a service, but the problem is, more often than not, I forget to cancel it and I end up being billed for something I may never use again. Rocket Money is able to quickly and easily identify your subscriptions and cancel them for you. It's really as easy as the click of a button. Things like the Paramount Plus subscription I've had for over six months that I didn't even realize I had. That was $11.99 a month, meaning I spent over $70 the last six months for something I only used to watch the real world reunion. And it's not just me. Rocket Money saves the average user over $720 a year, which is the equivalent to almost two Diet Cokes a day from McDonald's. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash moms. That's rocketmoney.com slash moms. Rocketmoney.com slash moms. This episode is sponsored by LifeMD. LifeMD is an amazing and affordable way to speak with a doctor without ever leaving your house. I'm beyond thankful that LifeMD even exists. If you've ever had, say, a UTI or pink eye and you know what you have, the idea of scheduling an appointment and driving all the way to the doctor to get a prescription for that very obvious thing you have is truly the worst. With LifeMD, you can have a virtual healthcare appointment with one of their incredible five-star certified physicians and get the medication or treatment you need when you need it. And I don't know about you, but the second we cross state lines, my kids are sick. Every vacation, every single time. The last time we were out of town, my son got sick within 24 hours. Luckily, I was able to schedule an appointment on LifeMD, see a fantastic doctor, and get a prescription for an antibiotic. The doctor was awesome, and I plan on calling again for the next inevitable vacation sickness. But LifeMD can handle way more than just those kids' sicknesses. They help with different needs ranging from annual checkups, even to lab work and chronic conditions like diabetes. Come to LifeMD for the convenience, stay for the five-star treatment. Visit LifeMD.com slash moms now or download their app and see why LifeMD is America's trusted telehealth leader. That's LifeMD.com slash moms to experience healthcare the way it should be. Now back to the episode. 
So before the break, we were talking a little about Robert Kissel, who was this wealthy investment banker living in Hong Kong with his wife, Nancy, and their three kids. Their marriage at this point is really on the rocks, and Rob finds out that Nancy's having an affair. He decides to go through with the divorce, but he wants it to be very smooth. He wants access to his kids and really is, I think, being pretty kind in this whole situation. For sure. Yeah. So he makes these plans to confront Nancy about wanting this divorce on November 2nd, 2003. That same afternoon, a neighbor comes by for a visit. He and Rob both have a milkshake that Nancy makes. And after that, no one outside the Kissel household ever saw Rob Kissel alive. At 4.51 that afternoon, Rob did make a phone call to his other good friend, David. And David's the friend that had been aware of all these issues in the Kissel marriage. He knew really everything that had been going on, and it seemed like he was Rob's closest friend. So Rob calls David shortly after the neighbor, Andrew, went home, and this call lasts for about 10 minutes. During the call, Rob was acting a bit strange, and David later described him as being like very mellow and had slurred speech. Rob also kept going off on these tangents and saying he was feeling very tired, but he did mention he was still planning on speaking with Nancy about this divorce that same night. So when Rob hangs up the phone with David, he takes his son to the playground for a bit, and Nancy ended up asking Min, one of their domestic helpers, to take the other children to the park to meet up with them. And Nancy tells Min that she wants Rob to come home by himself and for Min to stay at the park with all three of the children while they played. Min did as she was told, and Rob went back home. Later that night, Rob missed an important conference call for work, which wasn't like him at all. Min and the children returned from the apartment around 6.15 p.m. and were told by Nancy that Rob was sleeping. So Nancy asked Min to keep the children quiet. Min made dinner for the kids and then retired to her own room for the night, noticing really nothing out of the ordinary. The next morning at about 7 a.m., Min made breakfast for the kids and talked to Nancy. Nancy asked her not to clean the primary bedroom that day. She said Rob had left the apartment after an argument the night before and had gone to stay in a hotel. That same morning, the other helper, Connie, noticed that Nancy had a dressing on her right hand, which Nancy said was due to a burn she got from the oven. So Nancy left with the children and took them to school as usual, but Rob didn't carry out his usual routine that morning. When Rob failed to show up for work on the morning of November 3rd, his good friend and co-worker David was immediately concerned. As we said, it was already unusual that he had missed that conference call the night before, but not showing up for work that morning was extra alarming. David tried to reach Rob by phone all throughout the day, but never got an answer or a response. Meanwhile, Nancy had been quite busy that day. After she dropped the kids off at school, she sent an email to a family friend canceling a meeting they had planned for the following day. And in this email, she said that her husband was not well and she had to take care of some things with him. Nancy then searched the internet for where to buy luggage items and she left the apartment at about 9.30 that morning with a list that included luggage, bedding, towels, and bleach. Around 10 that morning, she ordered some cardboard boxes to be delivered to the house. And about 30 minutes later, she called Rob's phone, but he did not answer. She was seen on the CCTV footage at 11.51 a.m. carrying a bunch of shopping purchases, and she could be seen with a bandage on the back of her right hand. At noon, she called the office at the Parkview complex where they lived to ask if they had any storage rooms that she could rent. So the family actually already had one storage room, but Nancy was calling to find out if there was any extra storage rooms available, and the staff member told her that there weren't any available. So at 1230, Nancy left Parkview, and she came back a little bit over an hour later with a large black suitcase. At 3.40 p.m., Nancy looked up the Hong Kong police website and looked at the pages for missing persons. That's a wild find, I feel yeah. like, as this goes along. That is that is such a specific thing to be looking up. Well, even in, like, let's just say there's no possible nefarious circumstances, you would think that the fact that she was doing that at 3.40 in the afternoon, even if she didn't wasn't aware of what happened and didn't really know what was going on, she obviously was concerned enough to think that he could be missing or why would right. she be looking, you know, on those pages. And then, but at this point still hasn't contacted the police to say, hey, I haven't he- heard from my husband since last night. And I, you know, I'd, I'm worried that he might be right. missing. Why um, would so, somebody else be making that 
Like, right. Why would somebody else have, have reported him missing? It should have been her if, if that's what she was worried about. For so sure. Weird. Yeah. So at 5 p.m., Nancy left the apartment again, and this time she was gone for a while. She went shopping at several stores and made numerous purchases, including a chase lounge, a small carpet, and two scatter cushions. And all these items, except for the carpet, were scheduled to be delivered two days later on November 5th. Nancy also ordered a bed cover that was going to be delivered on November the 14th. She did purchase a bedspread from another store that she could take home with her that day, and she returned home at 6.41 p.m. and was seen once again on cameras carrying all of her purchases into her apartment. Later on that evening, David called Nancy because he still hadn't been able to get in touch with Rob and wanted to know where he was. And Nancy told David that the couple was having some family issues, and she told him that Rob would give him a call back. But Rob never called back. David then spent the next several days just trying to get in touch with Rob, but he had no success. And David wasn't the only one who tried to contact Rob multiple times. A close friend of Nancy and Rob named Brenna was worried after Nancy left her a voicemail stating that she and Rob had gotten into a fight that left Nancy with two broken ribs. Nancy went on to say she was going to have her injury documented and that her father was flying in to help her. Nancy also called her father and her half-brother that evening. She told them she'd been abused by Rob and that she had broken fingers and possibly broken ribs and that she'd be seeing the doctor in the morning. So Nancy's father got on a plane to Hong Kong as soon as he heard what was going on. On the morning of November 4th, Nancy told her helpers not to clean the primary bedroom again. Men noticed the injury on Nancy's hand and asked her about it, and Nancy told her she had burned herself on the oven. Later that day, Nancy asked the other helper, Connie, to buy peppermint oil. She asked for six boxes of it. Later that day, Nancy and Brenna got in touch again, and Nancy elaborated on the fight that she had with Rob on November 2nd. She said that Rob chased her around the bed, trying to get her to have sex with him, and then he beat her up and left the apartment. Nancy ended the call abruptly and said she had to take the children somewhere, but Brenna felt that Nancy was really forcing herself to sound upset which made Brenna start to question what was really going on and what really happened. And of course, that leads to the question, where was Rob? It was around 9 a.m. on the 4th when Nancy went to see her doctor, Dr. Dytham, about these injuries that she had allegedly sustained in this fight with Rob. When she arrived, she was hunched over and moving very slowly. She said that her husband, Rob, attacked her on the evening of the 2nd using his fist and his feet, and she had to fight him off with a fork. The injuries Nancy had on her included bruising and redness to the thumb and first finger on each hand, puncture wounds on the inner creases of the right hand, which was allegedly from this fork, bruising in a fingerprint pattern on the inner side of her right thigh, what looked like carpet burns on her knees, a bruise on the right shin, a bruise on her ankle, and a bruise on her lower left leg. Every time the doctor touched Nancy to examine her, Nancy would cry out in pain, which Dr. Dytham thought was really an overreaction and a sign that she was exaggerating her symptoms. The doctor also felt that Nancy's injuries weren't severe enough to have her doubled over and barely able to walk. None of her injuries indicated a serious or forceful blow, and x-rays showed that she did not have any fractured ribs or fingers. Before leaving the doctor's office, Nancy asked for a copy of the doctor's notes from the visit. Nancy returned to the apartment, but then she left again later that evening to go buy two more small carpets that were going to be delivered the next day, along with other items that she had already purchased. Finally, Nancy returned home for good that night. At about 9 o'clock, she showed one of the helpers, Connie, the injury that was on the back of her hand that she had previously said was from a burn on the oven. Connie noticed that it looked like something else. didn't look like a burn. There was also a cut on one of Nancy's fingers, and Nancy said that was from a fork, but she claimed to Connie that she didn't know how she had done it. Nancy also told Connie about her other ailments and explained to her that she and Rob had a really bad fight. Nancy said that Rob had been very drunk the night before, and he assaulted her. And she said that not only was he drinking, but he was also using cocaine. Connie asked where Rob was now, and Nancy suggested that he may have gone to stay in a hotel. In the meantime, Nancy was still talking to Brenna, who had also been unsuccessfully trying to get in touch with Rob. Nancy and Brenna actually spoke several times on November 4th and 5th, and Brenna said Rob had not contacted her at all. 
Nancy also told Brenna about how she was trying to pay the children's school tuition and started talking about how she, you know, she has this upcoming breast lift surgery in the middle of November. And, you know, really without even saying like, I'm concerned about where my husband is. She's like just coming out and saying, right. like, well, I guess I'm just – I'm not going to cancel that. I'm still going to go through with that, which, of course, the helper was kind of like, what? <laughs> like, why, yeah. are you, why are you worried about that, you know, right now? Right. So Brenna just felt really strange about the way that Nancy was so concerned about the weirdest things instead of the fact that Rob had not been seen or heard from in a few days. But still, attempts made by Brenna and Rob's best friend David uh, to reach him were not successful. By the morning of November 5th, everyone who knew Rob was really concerned for his whereabouts. That morning, the Kissel's helpers, Min and Connie, went into the living room at around 8.30 and saw that the carpet that was usually on the floor was now rolled up and placed behind the couch. This was pretty surprising to see since Nancy had been acting like she couldn't even stand up straight due to her injuries. Nancy told men that they were going to keep themselves busy that day, and she then assigned various tasks to each helper. Nancy sent Connie out to go buy towels, a bed cover, and other goods and told her that she couldn't bear to see the old things in the house because they reminded her of Rob, and she was very sad that Rob has left the house. She also wanted Connie to get some other things, such as adhesive tape used for packing. Men's job for the day was to empty the storeroom and put all of its contents in the corridor outside of the storeroom. Men did as she was told and moved everything except for one item out of the storage unit. Then was later told to go buy Nancy a Velcro belt for her sore ribs and to also go buy some rope. Around 10.30ish that morning, this was on the 5th, all those new things that Nancy purchased started being delivered. The Chase Lounge, two scatter cushions, and two carpets arrived, and Nancy instructed the delivery person to put the Chase Lounge in the primary bedroom and to remove a wood and leather chair that was currently in there, and she said she wanted it disposed of. Nancy had already paid for and requested that the delivery man place one of the new carpets under the bed in the primary bedroom, but on that morning, Nancy changed her mind and asked him to simply unroll the rug in the sitting room. Men soon returned with two reels of rope and saw that these new items had been delivered, as well as the old carpet being rolled up behind the couch. She asked Nancy what was inside the old carpet, and Nancy told her it was pillows, blankets, and bed sheets. At this point, though, Min starts to feel uneasy, and so she decides to reach out to Connie. That afternoon at about 2 o'clock, four employees from Parkview came to the Kissel apartment to collect the rolled-up carpet that Nancy wanted to dispose of. They also took some other items of furniture which were removed from the primary bedroom, along with a set of golf clubs and some empty boxes. One of the staff members actually mentioned that the carpet smelled like what he called salted fish, which is such an interesting way to describe it. smell. Uh, it's very specific. Um, but Aunt Nancy actually just ignored the comment, didn't say anything. She just paid him and closed the door. Later in the evening of November 5th, Nancy's father arrived in Hong Kong to be with her. As we said, she had phoned her father and brother, who, of course, live in the United States, and said, you know, Rob and I have had this terrible fight. I might have broken ribs. I'm going to go see a doctor. So her family is very concerned about what's going on. And her father has now flown into Hong Kong to just to help in any way that he can. David also called Nancy again on the same day to ask whether or not Rob had turned up or if Nancy knew any more about what was going on. Nancy told David that, once again, they're having some family issues and that there's a health problem they're dealing with, and then she ended the call. The next morning, now November 6th, Nancy called a friend and said, you know, she's dealing with some issues with Rob's health and that she's not going to be able to do some of the things that she was supposed to do for this upcoming gala dinner. Then Nancy and her father went down to the police station together so that she could file a report about the alleged assault that happened on November 2nd at about 9 p.m. Nancy stated that she and Rob were fighting over their marriage when he pushed her against the wall and beat her, and then he left the home and disappeared and hadn't been seen since. Nancy was highly emotional and very upset while she was making this report. She didn't give any details about Rob other than his name, though. She did hand over the report from Dr. Dytham, who she had seen on the 4th, and the officer that was taking the report noted all the injuries that he was able to observe on Nancy that particular day as well. 
So the injuries that the officer observed, keep in mind, this is several days now after um, right. November 2nd, but the injuries that were noted on her on the 6th included red marks on the left side of her jawline, red marks and bruises on the back of her right hand, red marks and bruising to her right elbow and left upper arm. And Nancy also said that she had shoulder pain. She was feeling in her right shoulder joint and her upper arm. Everything was kind of sore there. So at first, she actually declined seeing a government doctor because she had already seen Dr. Dytham. But then she changed her mind, and she was taken by an ambulance to the hospital with a woman police officer. However, once they arrived, and Nancy saw how long the wait to be seen at the hospital was, she decided that she was just didn't need to do that. She didn't need to see the doctor. Her and her father just left and went back to Parkview. At this point, it's been nearly 48 hours since anyone had seen or heard from Rob, and both David and Brenna talked amongst themselves about how concerning that this was getting. After talking to each other, David decided to take the next step to formally file a missing persons report at about 4 p.m. At 11 p.m., investigators responded to the missing persons report by showing up to the house with warrants. I was actually surprised they like showed up with warrants for just the start of a missing yeah. person's case, right? So Nancy tells them about this big fight that she and Rob had on the night of the second. She said the fight started because Rob was drunk and wanted to have sex and Nancy didn't. And things escalated quickly to the point of Nancy being beaten and injured. She said Rob took off after the fight and she hadn't seen him since then. But she said she had tried calling and leaving him messages. While investigators were there, Nancy called her dad and asked him to come over. And at about the exact same time, investigators got reports that there was a foul smell coming from one of the storage units inside the Parkview complex, and it turned out it was the storage unit belonging to the Kissels. Officers noted a bunch of cardboard boxes inside the apartment, so they asked Nancy if she was packing, and she said that she was, and it was to protect herself. She was asked to show them around the primary bedroom so she could demonstrate exactly how and where she was attacked. The room was in disarray, and Nancy demonstrated how the fight happened really quickly. The bathroom inside the primary bedroom also had numerous travel bags in the bathtub. When Nancy was asked about whether or not the family had a storage unit at Parkview, she lied and told them they didn't have one. Nancy then asked if she could speak to her father privately. After several minutes, her father went into the dining room where he was heard saying, quote, oh my God, I don't believe it, end quote, four or five times while holding each side of his head. At this point, Nancy had now begun to act differently as well. She was crying and trembling, whereas she had been really calm and collected before this. Nancy was asked once again about the storage room and whether or not she had a key she could provide them with. Nancy responded by asking if they had a warrant, and she said she wants to speak to a lawyer. The officers did have warrants to search the store room, and Nancy's dad even pointed out to her that the officers could simply break the door down if they wanted to. So he persuaded her to hand over the key. Officers then made their way down to the storage area while Nancy and her father stayed in the apartment. They both declined to go with the officers to the storage unit. So investigators arrived at the storage unit, and they were immediately met with the unmistakable smell of decomposition. Inside the unit was a wooden cabinet, a set of golf clubs, and a rolled-up carpet that was encased in plastic sheeting, and it was held together with brown adhesive tape. There were four scatter cushions that had also been taped along the length of this package. At this point, Nancy was crying and trembling uncontrollably, and so she was taken to the hospital to be treated. I guess I, di I didn't know that that seemed like a life-threatening emergency, that she was so upset and I guess the trembling is what did it. But they took her to be treated at the hospital. Wait till she finds out how long she has to wait because last time right. she left. <laughs> yeah. So while she was doing that, being taken for treatment, the investigators were working to unwrap the rolled up carpet. And it was then that they confirmed the worst case scenario. Rob's body was found inside the carpet. It had been placed inside of a zipped up sleeping bag. There were rope and towels also used to package the body. Rob was found wearing black boxer shorts and a bloodstained t-shirt that had blood mostly on the front and not as much on the back, but there was a little bit on the back. His skull had been bashed in and was covered with a towel and plastic sheeting. An autopsy later confirmed that Rob was hit five separate times in the upper right side of his head. Any one of the blows he sustained could have been fatal. His skull was fractured and the bone was driven through his brain. 
it was determined that Rob had been dead for about four days. Further tests showed that Rob was impaired by four different sedatives. So the four sedatives they found, um, a couple of them might sound pretty common. One was Ambien, and another one of, one of them was Ativan. But they also found um, what is commonly known on the street as the, the roofie drug, which it is a med- it is a medication that you can be prescribed. But whenever you mix it with alcohol, of course, that's what provides the impairing effects of blacking out and things like that. And they also found a fourth substance that was called emitriptyline. And so it's believed that he was either unconscious or really heavily incapacitated at the time that he was bludgeoned. He showed no sign of defensive injury, which indicated that he wasn't able to defend himself from the attack. He was also thought to likely have been laying face down when the blows to his head were delivered. Back to the storage unit and to Nancy, who was at the hospital due to her uncontrollable crying and trembling. After the officers had unrolled the carpet and had discovered Rob's body, Nancy was arrested while she was still at the hospital. And at this point, it was about 2.40 in the morning on November the 7th. When Nancy was arrested, she refused to speak with the police, and she ended up being transferred to the custodial ward of the hospital, where she was examined by a doctor for the injuries that she allegedly sustained when Rob supposedly attacked her on the night of November the 2nd. The doctor who examined her noted bruises on her hands, arms, and elbows, which they concluded were probably about two to three days old, but not likely to be as many as four to six days old, which is important because Nancy was claiming that she got these bruises five days earlier at this point. Once it was determined that Rob had been bludgeoned, investigators went back to the Kissel apartment to look for the potential murder weapon. They found a base plate and two figurines hidden in a black bag inside of a wardrobe, along with other bloodstained items that were found in the two daughters' bedroom. It was determined that all these pieces were once a single-piece statue. So the base plate and these two figurines all used to be a one-piece item, and this was actually an old family heirloom that was given to Nancy by her grandmother. Oof. Yeah. Investigators did also find a baseball bat, but it was tested for traces of blood and didn't show any. The medical examiner looked at the base plate and the figurines that used to be one whole statue and determined that the fatal blows were consistent with Rob being bludgeoned with it. The medical examiner said he thought the base plate had become detached from the figurines at some point while Nancy was attacking Rob and that when that happened, it exposed three sharp nails. So they believe that Nancy held the statue and used these figurines like handles and smashed Rob's head until the base plate actually detached. And then these three exposed and sticking out nails are what investigators believe caused the injury to Nancy's hand, not a fork, as she had Mm. previously told investigators. Testing determined that Nancy and Rob's blood were both on the statue, meaning that there was a pretty good chance that this was the murder weapon. As investigators dug into Rob's murder and continued looking into Nancy and her involvement, they learned about all of these marital problems that we spoke about earlier. The affair, Rob wanting to get a divorce, all of it was all coming to light. It was learned that Nancy made some internet searches that were pretty sketchy, including sleeping pills overdose, overdose on sleeping pills, medications causing heart attacks, and drug overdose. They also found a diary kept by Nancy where she wrote that she knew Rob had hired a PI to surveil her and she didn't think Rob would ever trust her again. At some point after she found out about the PI, Nancy went on to purchase all four of the sedatives found in Rob's system. She obtained 10 tablets of Ambien on August 29th. She told the doctor at the clinic, named Dr. Fung, that her marriage was troubled and arguments sometimes led to violence. That same day, Rob called the PI and said that he felt woozy and disoriented after drinking some scotch whiskey from the decanter at home. The PI, named Frank, told him to take the scotch to a lab and have it tested. But unfortunately, Rob didn't do that. So Frank, this PI, flies to Hong Kong to meet with Rob in person, and he told Rob he thought Nancy was trying to kill him. But Rob wasn't 100% sold on that being the case, although he did start worrying about his safety a bit more. That has to be an unreal thing for an outside person to be telling you this. And this is this person you've built an entire life with and you're having problems, but surely they don't want to kill you. Like that would be such a hard thing to accept. So on October 23rd, Nancy saw Dr. Ditham and talked about having a low mood since her husband first attacked her a year earlier, which had been followed by other assaults, she claimed. 
Dr. Dytham asked her if Rob ever raped Nancy, and she said no. She told Dr. Dytham that she had been taking her husband's sleeping pills, which were Ambien, but they weren't very effective for her, and she wanted something stronger. So Dr. Dytham then prescribed 10 tablets of Rofenol and warned her about the possible side effects of blacking out, especially when taken with alcohol. Later on that same day, Nancy searched the internet for information on this drug and learned that it could reduce inhibitions, impair judgment, and cause loss of consciousness as well as amnesia. A week later, on October 30th, Nancy went to Dr. Fung. He was the doctor that gave her the Ambien tablets for the first time, and she got 10 more tablets of Ambien, plus 15 tablets of Ativan. She didn't mention to the doctor she had already gotten a prescription from Dr. Dytham a week earlier, but she did mention that at this point her marriage has deteriorated and there were even talks of divorce. On this visit, Nancy told Dr. Fung she was in a distressed mental state. Investigators also learned that Rob had told a friend and his attorney on October 31st that he was planning to talk to Nancy about getting a divorce. And we still have more to get into after one last break to hear word from this week's sponsors. Our puppies are definitely a part of the family. Lila and Reese bring so much joy to our household, and we want to make their life as great as possible. And one way we can help do that is with Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food right to your door with every portion personalized to your dog's needs. I was so excited to hear this because my little puppy Reese has a tendency towards low blood sugar, and so she requires a very specific diet. So I can't wait to start her on Nom Nom. I am really quick to give Remy food scraps because he loses his ever-loving mind for the freshness of real food. But I know it's probably not all great for him, so I can't wait to start him on Nom Nom. Nom Nom is made with real, whole food you can actually see and recognize. So Remy will definitely lose his ever-loving mind when he starts this. It can be a little nerve-wracking to start a new dog food. I totally get that. And so does Nom Nom. That's why it comes with a money-back guarantee. If your dog isn't all about that Nom Nom life in the first 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your order. Go right now for 50% off your no-risk two-week trial at trynom.com slash moms. Spelled trynom.com slash moms for 50% off. trynom.com slash moms. The new year is all about starting new habits, which makes it the perfect time to start your new hair care routine with the world's most personalized hair care brand, Pros. Pros is personal, which means they aren't just asking you these generic hair questions like, is your hair straight or curly? But they're getting to know you and your environment to make the perfect formula just for you. And Pros does that by having you take their in-depth hair quiz, which is how I got started. I answered all the normal questions as to whether my hair is dry or oily, but I was even answering questions about how often I exercise and my zip code, which are all things that affect my hair. I was sort of shocked when I saw the zip code question, actually, until I remembered how different Florida weather is. We're always talking about it on the show, so it only makes sense that my perfect pros formula takes into account how the weather will be affecting my hair. My pros has ingredients like apple cider to give my hair shine and biotin to add strength, both of which my hair has been lacking. Not only is my hair beginning to look soft and shiny, but it feels better already. I chose the Oasis fragrance as part of my custom shampoo, but you can choose another yummy scent or choose none at all. I have precious moments baby doll thin hair, so I love that my hair is now feeling stronger thanks to pros. Give pros a try, and if you're not 100% positive that it's the best hair care you've ever had, then they'll even take the products back. No questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash moms. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash moms for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great, gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered, too, with a training pant that's ultra-soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. 
Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we have already given so many details about the lives of Robert Kissel and his wife, Nancy. Uh, We've talked about how they've been having several marital problems. There's been discussions of getting a divorce. Now, investigators have just learned that Rob has tragically been bludgeoned to death, and his body was found wrapped in a rug inside of the family's storage unit. So after gathering all of the evidence that they could, the working theory was that Nancy had drugged Rob with the milkshake that she prepared for him and the neighbor Andrew that had come over that afternoon to let his daughter play. If you recall, Andrew also drank this milkshake, and he did ask Nancy what was in it because he thought something was different about it, and Nancy said it was a secret recipe, and then Andrew just went on back to his apartment. Although Andrew said he didn't have any alcohol that day, he did say that he spent the rest of the day either blacked out or semi-conscious or asleep. The next morning, Andrew still felt disoriented, and he couldn't recall much of what happened after 4 p.m. the day before. He described it feeling like amnesia, which was something he had never experienced before, and his family also noticed his unusual appearance and condition that day. So investigators believe that Nancy had spiked these milkshakes with the sedatives, and then when all the drugs reached their peak concentration and Rob was mostly unconscious, that is when Nancy took the opportunity to beat him with the statue. And they believe that this took place between 5.15 to 6.15 p.m., as that is when Nancy and Rob were alone in the house because the kids were at the park with the helper. When the nanny and the kids returned, Nancy told them that Rob was sleeping, and then she started trying to cover up the murder with a series of lies. Nancy was taken to the psychiatric center where she remained until she was released on bail about a year later. She said that while she was there, she had come to realize that there were significant gaps in her memory, and she didn't have a lot of memory from the weekend of November 2nd. News of Rob's murder and Nancy's arrest sent shockwaves through the Hong Kong expat community. People just could not believe that Nancy, who had a reputation for being a fabulous mother and wife, had killed her husband, especially in this violent, violent way. After Nancy was taken into custody, she and Rob's children, who were nine, six, and four at the time, were sent back to the United States where they ended up living with numerous different family members, including Rob's brother, Andrew, and his wife, Haley, who lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. Nancy went to trial for the murder on June 7, 2005. It was really a highly sensational trial as it offered a look into the lives of a very wealthy couple. The press named it the milkshake murder and covered it really just as heavily as the OJ case. Nancy showed up to trial looking completely different than she had when she was arrested. Honest to goodness, we'll have some of these um, pictures up Oh, on our YouTube channel, right? We're yeah. doing like a little yes. YouTube channel. You can find yes. that. Surprise. Um, we'll put that's it in another, the show notes. That's another 2023 <laughs> surprise for you. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have some of those pictures up, but she truly does not look like the same person before uh, her trial and after. It's wild. And it makes it me is. wonder. Well, because you, I feel like you see this sometimes though, where it's like their attorney's trial try intentionally to make them look worse before they go to trial because I guess for sympathy reasons or to make them seem like they're not like the average normal person or, you know, or that in her case that she wasn't this person wealthy, right. This privileged wealthy woman. So they try to make them like they downplay their appearance a little bit. And so I wonder if that was Mm -hmm. kind of what was going on here. I mean, her facial structure doesn't even really look the same to me. She looks completely different. You could say that it was two different people. It's, It's that different. So her hair is black and she looks more natural, not really flamboyantly rich like she had looked for so long before. The PI that Rob hired even said he couldn't believe Nancy was the same person he surveilled and that her looks had changed dramatically. Prosecutors allege that Nancy spent months planning the murder and that she wanted Rob dead to avoid a messy divorce and to get her hands on his $18 million estate so she could move back to the U.S. and be with Michael, the TV repairman. Evidence showed that she researched overdosing on sleeping pills and then purchased four sedatives, all of which were found in Rob's system when he died. They theorized that Nancy knew Rob was going to ask for a divorce on November 2nd, and that's why she killed him that day. They further alleged that Nancy tricked Rob into drinking the potent milkshake, which, by the way, she her daughter is the one who gave it to Rob and this neighbor, Andrew. Just a totally wild thing. I still don't understand why she 
gave it to Andrew, but to have your kid hold a milkshake to give to their dad, knowing it's literally filled with poison yeah. is wild. So crazy. So Nancy knew the medications would be at peak concentration during the hours between 5.15 and 6.15 because, again, she's researched it. And that's why she asked their helper men to stay with the kids at the playground. So Rob came home, changed into his boxers, and was getting ready to take a nap. But he actually passed out on the floor of the bedroom. And that's when Nancy grabbed the statue and started hitting him in the head until the base plate came off. She then went to great lengths to conceal Rob's death. So when it came time for Nancy's defense, nobody was really sure what it was even going to be because she had refused to ever speak to the investigators. So it was really a surprise that day to see her defense team quickly put Nancy on the stand to tell her story. Nancy claimed that Rob had been abusing her for years and that she killed him when he attacked her on November 2nd. She said their marriage had taken a decline in the last five or so years because, according to her, Rob had a drinking problem and he used cocaine. She said the violence began in 1999 and only got worse. The crux of the issue, according to Nancy, was that Rob was always demanding sexual acts that Nancy didn't want any part of, and she said that Rob would frequently overpower her and force her to do these things. She claimed that in 2001, Rob broke one of her ribs while she was resisting having sex with him, and that in 2002, she had her foot and ankle in a cast thanks to Rob. She also alleged that he had given her a black eye once before. She claimed she always made up a story to explain away the injuries that she received at Rob's hand uh, so that nobody would have any idea what was going on. So please keep in mind that there is absolutely no proof or documentation that Rob ever attacked Nancy in the ways that she says he did. Um, Nancy herself told the doctor that rape was not involved in the issues that she was having with Rob. Of course, that's not to say that she was lying, you know, about anything. It doesn't mean that she was lying about anything, but it does kind of bring her credibility into question a little bit because she was point blank asked, is this something that is going on and that you need help with? And she told these doctors no. So Nancy said that the marriage was in big trouble by the end of 2002 and that their family Christmas trip that year did have a lot of unhappy moments in it, including that Rob hit her across the mouth, causing her to fall down a flight of stairs. She said they discussed counseling when they returned to Hong Kong, but they never took any action toward it. In March 2003, she and the kids went to Vermont to stay at the vacation house, where she admitted to starting an affair with Michael and said that they slept together three-ish times. Well, I don't want to know what the (laughs) ish is. (laughs) I don't want to know what that was. So according to Nancy, Rob had come to see the family in May of that year, and they argued nearly every day that he was there. She said that he was using cocaine and was having these major mood swings. She said during this trip, she actually crushed an Ambien and put it in his scotch, hoping to calm him down so that she would have a break from what she called pretty intense sexual activity. But she said that she didn't really notice any effect on Rob after giving him the sleeping pill. Nancy did admit to crushing a pill and putting it in the scotch decanter at home in Hong Kong, but says that the crushed pill was actually visible when she did it, so she ended up dumping it out, and he never drank from that bottle. She said that she never drugged Rob again, including with the milkshake. That's wild to admit that you've ever done that, like, in your life to have ever drugged somebody and then be like, but not this time. Yeah, but then it's also wild because, like you said, like, I guess she didn't care if her child took a sip of this. But then it's also like, why did you drug the neighbor? Like, what did he do? I don't (laughs) get that at all. It doesn't make any sense. It actually seems worse because, like, now you have somebody that's like, oh, yeah, by the way, she I think she drugged me as well. That's right. I don't get it. So Nancy also testified that the reason she was searching the Internet for information about sleeping pill overdoses was because she was contemplating taking her own life. She said she even took the roofie pills on August 29th, but changed her mind and made herself throw up. Prosecutors pointed out that Nancy told her defense psychiatrist that she had never attempted suicide, and Nancy never told any friends or family about this alleged suicide attempt either. Nancy said she killed Rob after a violent argument in which Rob told her he filed for divorce and was, quote, taking the kids because Nancy was sick and she was not fit to care for them. Nancy said she noticed that Rob was leaning on a baseball bat, which he then moved from one hand to the other. So she said that's when she picked up this metal ornamental statue from a table in the hallway. It was at this point that Nancy said the assault began, with Rob pulling her into the bedroom and attempting to force her into having sex, which she resisted. 
While Rob was sitting near the closet, Nancy said she hit him in the head with the statue, causing him to bleed. Nancy said Rob threatened to kill her after that, coming at her with a baseball bat, forcing her to defend herself by holding the statue in front of her face. She said she had no recollection of what happened next and didn't remember hitting Rob in the head five times with the statue. However, she did accept that she had killed him while defending herself. She talked about how she also had a hard time remembering a few days after the murder as well, meaning she didn't remember these great lengths she went to cover up Rob's death, which is all very extremely convenient. Yeah. She claimed the memory loss continued for six months, and when she was in the psychiatric center, things began to come back to her in pieces. But overall, she was still affected by memory loss. The defense brought on Dr. Dietham to testify about Nancy's injuries, which ended up backfiring on them during cross-examination. Because on cross, Dr. Dietham admitted to thinking Nancy was actually exaggerating the pain she was complaining about, and that she noticed puncture wounds on the inner creases of Nancy's right hand, which she had said was from a fork, but that knowing now about the three nails that held these figurines to this base plate of the statue, Dr. Dietham also agreed that the wounds on Nancy's hand could have come from that and not from a fork. The doctor also said that the carpet burns on Nancy's knees could have come from being dragged during an assault or from when Nancy was pushing and pulling Rob's body while kneeling on the carpet. A psychiatrist, Dr. Wong, testified for the defense and said that Nancy was suffering from a depressive disorder and probably dissociative amnesia on November 2nd and that she was likely in a dissociative fugue state for a few days afterwards. Then she continued to suffer from a mild degree of major depressive disorder, which she was still suffering with at her trial. These conclusions were based largely on what Nancy said about her history with Rob. Nancy made Rob out to be a violent, heavy drinker who used cocaine and forced her to have various kinds of sex that she didn't want to have, which culminated in the violent argument that led to Rob's murder. Once Nancy was done giving her testimony, prosecutors had their chance to pick the story apart. They pointed out that Nancy never mentioned Rob holding a baseball bat until she met with Dr. Wong in January 2005, and that when she went to see Dr. Dytham less than 48 hours after the attack, Nancy told her that Rob used his feet and fists to attack her. Nothing about a baseball bat. Prosecutors refuted Nancy's entire account of the abuse from Rob and said she came up with that story after she killed him so she would have an excuse for her actions, but that her claims of abuse were really contradicted by her own statements to others and by the evidence. Many witnesses spoke on the stand for the prosecution, including family members from Rob and Nancy's families, including their friends, domestic helpers Min and Connie, and work colleagues. All of these people denied Nancy's claims about Rob's abuse. They said Rob was a very pleasant person and that he was a loving father. These witnesses said that Rob did not drink excessively or use cocaine and that Nancy really made all of that up. Men testified that she worked with the family beginning in 2000 and that Rob and Nancy had once been happy, but towards the end of 2003, it was clear there were issues. Men said there were, quote, no more sweetness, end quote, but she said she'd never seen any violent episodes between them and never seen any signs of injury on Nancy's body. Min said that when Nancy and the kids returned to Hong Kong in July 2003 after living in Vermont, Nancy gave Rob the cold shoulder and they weren't even really speaking to each other. When Rob would leave to go on overseas visits, Nancy wouldn't even say goodbye to him. The family's other domestic helper, Connie, said that Rob was a thoughtful person who never seemed to be hot-tempered to her. Connie said Rob only drank beer moderately at social occasions. Connie noticed that there was a positive change in the couple's relationship in August, but it only lasted about a month before Nancy went back to paying no attention to him. Finally, prosecutors pointed out that although Nancy kept a diary, she never wrote about a single instance of violence or sexual abuse at the hands of Rob. After both sides were done presenting, the jury was sent away with a lot of information to wade through and a ton of questions to answer. The fact that Nancy had killed Rob wasn't up for debate or in dispute at all. The question was, was this murder pre-planned or was it in self-defense? It was clear that Nancy took steps and actions to conceal Rob's body and his death by lying to multiple people. But did she do that to cover up a murder or did she panic and try to hide the murder even though it was legitimately done in self-defense? And then what about the abuse allegations? Was any of that true or was that more of Nancy's lies? On September 1st, after seven hours of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict. Nancy was found guilty of premeditated murder and was immediately sentenced to life in prison. 
She did appeal her conviction, but her first appeal was denied. So she filed another one on the grounds that the prosecutors breached evidence rules during her trial by improperly questioning Nancy during her testimony. She also alleged that the judge wrongfully allowed hearsay evidence into the courtroom. In February 2010, the Court of Final Appeal overturned Nancy's conviction and ordered a retrial, which happened in early 2011. The retrial was almost identical to the first trial, with prosecutors alleging that Nancy pre-planned Rob's murder while the defense stuck with the abused wife and self-defense story. The retrial lasted 47 days, but in the end, it was all for naught because on March 25th, 2011, the second jury found Nancy guilty of murder and she was once again sentenced to life in prison. She has unsuccessfully tried to appeal the second conviction as well. And lastly, the Kissel family has truly been through so much after Rob was brutally murdered, but one of the most unfair things I think you can possibly imagine is that Rob's brother, Andrew, who is the one who he said took Rob's kids in, Rob and Nancy's children in, he was also tragically murdered in 2006, just a few years after his brother. And I really wish we had enough time to get into the full details of that case today. But as you guys can hear, this has already gone on for quite some Ooh. time. Um, so we are going to have to ask you to just come back next week to hear more about what happened to Andrew Kissel. Yeah, absolutely. I still can't get over. I mean, you and I kind of talked off mic before this about I don't I just don't know that I can't decide if it was planned before because it's so chaotic. Like all the stuff she did after doesn't make sense on somebody that would plan it. But I definitely think. See, I don't she's... know because where you get me with that is the drugged milkshake or the, giving him drugs and finding True. that much sedative in his system. That takes some degree of planning because even after you give somebody all those sedatives, you don't you still don't have to go through with killing them. Right. You know what I think? Maybe it was more like she really did plan to drug him to kill him. He didn't die. And then she was like, well, this is the next step. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the the – the cover-up was terrible. Like Terrible. She, very chaotic. So obvious. So chaotic. Yeah. So I don't know. The whole story is so sad. I feel so bad for the kids. Like that's just that's that's just so much to have gone through. So it's a um, lot. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. All right, guys. Well, that was the first episode of the new year. Uh, as I said, we'll be kind of jumping right back into this family story next week with uh with our episode on Andrew Kissel. So yes, definitely come back and hear us next week. <laughs> yeah. Before we go, though, we have a last thing before we go. Last thing before we go, it's just like a little palate cleanser, something fun to do at the end of the episode. Doesn't have anything to do with the episode. It's just a way to end it on a more light note, right? Yes. So Mandy, we kind of talked about doing, it's very cold here. Okay. Other places, way colder. I've watched more videos of people like yeeting themselves down the street in Seattle and just yes. all kinds of crazy you know, things. I feel so I bad. know that we have all been in frozen weather. It's been really cold because of, there was that big, what were they calling it? Arctic the bomb blast, cyclone I think. or something. Oh, yeah. Gosh, so I don't know. That's what they were, yeah. So um, obviously everybody who's listening knows that right before Christmas, you know, right, right just in time for Christmas weekend, everybody pretty much in the US got like a crazy cold snap. And we also did. And uh, I know that we are always saying like when it's cold here, like we're really cold and we complain, but then everyone hates to hear that because we live in Florida. And so everyone's right. like, how cold can it be? But um, I had ran into a similar thing the other day where I was like, you know what? I wish people would just stop telling me that I'm not allowed to be cold when it's cold outside. <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. it's kind of, you know, I had, um, I posted something recently. Um, I got a new car and my new car has a heated steering wheel. And I was telling someone how like nice it was to have a heated steering wheel. And the person I was talking to, um, is not from Florida. And so it, it was just almost like a, like a, oh, you know, that would also be really nice in Michigan or something like that. And I'm like, yeah. well, I'm sure that it, like, sure it would. But it's like <laughs> saying you can't have air conditioning up north. Like, no, you're yeah. fine. You can have air conditioning. Right. Exactly. Whatever. I'm like, okay, whether or not, I don't care where you're from, to me, being below 30 is cold. So we definitely experienced a few days of that. And I am thankful that we do not have too many more days. I that. know. <laughs> I know. I'm I'm feeling for you guys because I have a beanie on now and I'm very comfortable, but I'm like, well, I can never do this again, but my hair has never looked better. So it's such a problem for me. I agree. <laughs> yes. I know. There's no humidity. There's no frizziness oh, or anything. So like everything great. is so smooth and shiny. <laughs> yeah. But I know it's been really, really hard and some people have been without heat and all that stuff. It's so tough, but we wanted to take a little bit of a lighter turn in, uh, 
weather and weather talk, hashtag weather talk. We are just doing last thing before we go. We're doing kind of would you rather. We came up with three questions a piece. I had my kids help me with one. My daughter, not interested, but my son helped me. So you'll have to figure out which one he asked. But Mandy, would you like to kick it off with your first would you rather cold weather edition? Sure. And I hope that I... I hope that I did this correctly. <laughs> we'll find out right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my first one, um, I actually did ask my kids, and I think you did too, but I only had one child give me any ideas, and the other one right. was just not understanding the point of the mm-hmm. whole thing. So this one is from one of my kids. I won't say which one. Um, so would you rather be in freezing cold weather and only have summer clothes to wear or would you rather be in a very, very hot climate and all you have on are winter clothes and can't take them off? Oh, I cannot stand being hot. I can't take it. The idea of like, if you ever had a, like a hoodie on, not the zip up one, but the one that, you know, like a proper hoodie yes. and been hot, like gotten into a hot car or something. And I literally feel myself choking. Like my mouth is watering. It makes me I don't nauseous. Know like it makes yeah, me it's- <laughs> I can't take it like going into a really hot room when you have too much or like putting your jacket on in the vehicle and then it's hot. Uh, I, there's nothing worse in the world. In the world. That's terrible. Yeah. So I want the other one, but I don't like the other one either. But I, I don't, won't be mad. I see, I don't know. I disagree. I mean, I agree with you that being hot and not being able to do anything about it is one of the worst things ever. But um, I don't think I could be out in the cold with summer clothes on for very long either. I think I would almost rather be hot yeah. and have to wear a sweatshirt than I would to be cold and have to wear a tank top. You know, it doesn't really sound, <laughs> they both sound terrible. I like but. that I'm really thinking this is a situation I'm going to run into. I'm right, like, like you have know. to make a decision. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go the hot. I just, cause I know my rage issues in the heat and I can't imagine being hotter than that. Otherwise I'm going to be miserable in the cold, but I won't be, I won't be looking for people to hurt well, like I would the other way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So Mandy, mine, I have one of those, so I'm going to cross that one off for me. But here's my next one. Uh, Would you rather, (laughs) which one did my kid pick? Would you rather eat a scorpion uncooked in the snow? We got it. (laughs) It's weather related. (laughs) Or would you, you, (laughs) almost the same thing. Or would you rather eat a worm in the snow, also uncooked? So it is cold weather related. I definitely have to go with worm because I'm Scared that the scorpion's gonna poison me somehow. What if it juices out? Like when you bite it, no it juices. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like with a worm, you could almost just like swallow it whole. Oh. <laughs> I watched too much Fear Factor years ago, and so I'm gonna go with you because I know they ate scorpions, and I can see like people dry heaving in my head thinking oh. about this. Okay, it's because okay. the legs. No, Mm-mm. to me, I feel around. like blah, blah, blah. the smooth body of a worm would be a much more palatable than the crunchy leg. Ew, no. But I here's the thing. Scorpion. I'm going to add one thing to it. What if the worm was screaming, no, no, please don't kill me <laughs> while you were doing it and the scorpion you're just eating? Uh, I don't know. Plug your ears and swallow yeah. the worm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Mandy, what's your next one? Okay. So my next one is, would you rather work as a team with your extended family, I'm talking about n- maybe not your favorite family members, but okay. maybe ones that you only see at holidays and you're happy about that. Would you rather work as a team with them to build a snowman or would you rather be tasked with building an igloo all by yourself? Oh, I would always rather do stuff. Uh, just a snowman with people I don't like. You got to work together. Uh. Got to work together. I mean, I feel like a snowman's easier to build than an igloo. <laughs> so right. if it was the opposite, I think I would do, I would choose myself every time. But if I need help, I'm not strong enough to build it. <laughs> You're a, like, I choose me. <laughs> yeah. I sh- <laughs> Hashtag I chose me. Um, Mandy, what about you? Um, I think I would rather. Think about it. Think of I the worst. Know. I know. Because I'm kind of with you where I'm more inclined to just take on a big task by myself because I'm also like. No one's going to do it right. I'll I'm do it right. One. Exactly. I'm going to do I'm going to be the only one who can do this right. So I feel like I would try to do it on my own because I'll, I mean, I'm imagining some of the people that could be in my teamwork yeah. group and I just don't think it would be a good I don't think it'd be There's a good There's one on yours that I think if you got it would be over. It would oh, just for be sure. over. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one of those too. Here's my last one. Mandy, would you rather for life have a 
red round nose like Rudolph or have a carrot like nose. <laughs> These I definitely are technically cold weather. I definitely want a Rudolph nose instead of I wouldn't want a carrot nose. Quick question. What if it was a regrowable carrot and you could break it off, eat a snack, go about your day? <laughs> No, because I don't like carrots enough to want to do that. Now, if I get to have like a taco for a nose, I can just keep Yes, okay. Things. New rule. Would you rather have a taco for your <laughs> nose or a Rudolph nose? Definitely a taco. <laughs> now, keep in mind the taco, the meat would yell, don't kill me, don't kill me. <laughs> why, are, why are all these things talking at me? <laughs> like, They're all like, yeah, I don't know. I've got like possessed things all in mind. I need a nap. I think I need a nap. <laughs> okay, so I just have one last one then. Okay. This one should be easy. It just depends on what you like more, your hands or your feet. So <laughs> would you like – Would not? I don't think you would like either one. Would you rather put your bare feet in the snow for 30 minutes or put your bare hands in the snow for 30 minutes? Oh, cold hand. Oh, what? I don't oh. – <laughs> <laughs> These are making me think too much. I'd feel one of – each frozen hands or frozen feet? Frozen, frozen hands, hands or frozen, frozen, frozen feet? feet? Are they yeah. falling off after this? Or well, I said 30 exactly. minutes. So yeah, they would probably be like completely frostbitten, dead tissue. You wouldn't even have these limbs anymore. So we could shorten the amount of time. Let's say for three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Okay. I'm, I'm going to do feet because then I'll just put – I don't want to see them anyway. Maybe I'll turn purple. Maybe people will have to carry me around like Mariah Carey <laughs> after. Yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. What about you? I think I would do hands. I don't like my feet being cold and like I just don't like that. I know that feeling it's like when you're up north and you have like even when I have boots on, I hate that feeling of like having my toes being freezing and like not really yeah, understanding why when I'm like why I have like four pairs of socks on and I have shoes on. Why are my toes still cold? I don't understand how that even happens. But that tells me that I would not like having my bare feet in the snow. I've only seen snow like one time and I was a teenager. So I'm probably, it's probably not fair for me to answer that. I'm just thinking, but like stingy ice on your hands, like if ice has been on your hands, you know, like holding something really cold. Oh, oh yeah. No, that stings. That's like a different kind of pain. Yeah. Wow. Luckily, we'll never be in this situation. No one will ever make us do this, but it's something to the, think about. Yeah. These were very interesting hypothetical scenarios. <laughs> I would like to eat a scorpion. Okay, well, thank you guys very much for listening. And we'll maybe we'll put this on social media um, yeah. if you'd like to answer those questions. And before we go, we do have TikTok as well. I'm looking to see what it is. We're kind of transferring things. We're working really hard to kind of update, do more things in the new year. So if you want to follow us on TikTok, it's Moms and Mysteries. It's there shorter than our other one. So yeah, yeah, Moms and Mysteries, you can find us there. We'll be we have a TikTok schedule. Haley's helping us get organized. This is going to be our year and if this it's is not, our please year. don't tell us yeah. in 2024 that we <laughs> promised 2023 was our year. Yeah. Well, that's why I didn't make any New Year's resolutions because the only thing I can focus on is delivering what we have promised each other we're going to do this year. Oh. So I, can't, I cannot be committed to any other um, resolutions. This is rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be a good year, though. It will be. All right, guys. Well, that was it for this week. We will be back next week. Same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.